Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Conn Report wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, again, you always know the drill. Like button, subscribe button. We'll move on from that. If you want to find us on YouTube, go to Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. It would be much appreciated. Today, I'm joined by my New York Giants colleague from ESPN, Jordan Ronan, as we discuss the New York Giants. <laughs> the one team that I think that is the consensus about, and that would be for last place. But Jordan and I talk about what the Giants can expect this year, where, where there are some really big holes, uh, Daniel Jones's growth, some of the offensive weapons they had, et cetera. I also get some perspective from Jordan on the Washington Commanders, and I do think he likes this roster. So stay tuned for that. As a reminder, first of all, you can follow both our works on ESPN.com, and you can follow Jordan on Twitter at Jordan Ranan. That's Jordan, R-A-A-N-A-N. He also has the Breaking Big Blue podcast that you can find wherever you find your podcast. He's also on YouTube, so check him out there. I did a recent interview with him. So there you go. Before I get to the interview, as you know, I'm still on vacation. This is all recorded before I left for out of the country. So don't expect any reaction to me from news. I'm providing you with this content out here so we can stay informed throughout the summer months leading into training camp. With that, let's get to my conversation with ESPN NFL Nation reporter, Jordan Rana. All right, Jordan, it's the annual stepchildren of the NFC East conversation. So I just, <laughs> want, to get, I just want to get a feel for the Giants offseason, a lot of changes. Where are they at now compared to end of the season? You can make the argument their roster is even worse right now. I mean, they had to get rid of some guys. I mean, they had to get rid of James Bradbury. That was a, a salary cap move. Uh, they had to get rid of – well, they didn't have to, but they want, They elected to get rid of Logan Ryan. Uh, Evan Ingram left. Granted, Evan Ingram struggled, but it's not like – Right. They didn't have the resources then to go fill the positions. Now, they have a, a big promising rookie class, but we're talking about rookies. I'm talking about their roster for this year. We're talking about rookies, and rookies oftentimes struggle in this league. You know, it's not that easy to come in and make an instant impact, especially a fourth-round tight end, right? Daniel Bellinger. Like, I would, uh, he's running with the first team right now, John. Uh, that Adoree Jackson is now their number one cornerback, and their number two cornerback is – up in the air, like nobody who's ever proven to play. Their slot cornerback, no one who's ever proven they could play at a high level in this league. Their second safety spot now, uh, Julian Love, really like a utility man for most of his career. So this organization had a lot of change. They kind of, I think, realized, hey, we've got to take it on the chin this year. It's going to be a tough one, but we're rebuilding. We'll try and compete this year, slap it together with a lot of one-year deals veteran type guys, you know, like mid-range, low, low range veteran guys like John Feliciano at center. Uh, Mark Lewinsky at right guard was their big move this offseason, one of their big moves. So, you know, Mark Lewinsky and a backup quarterback in Tyrod Taylor. So just kind of slap it together, compete, be competitive. Well, like what they did in Buffalo, Joe Shane and Brian Dable come from Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Joe, it, when Brandon Bean and, and Sean McDermott took over there, First year, they did make the playoffs with Tyrod Taylor, but they just tried to slap it together. Second year, drafted Josh Allen. Now we see where that franchise is now. Well, seeing that you have that kind of year this year, you can be in a position to draft what, somebody from what should be a good quarterback class. So they, they may set themselves up better than some of these other teams. That's teams. an option. Yep. It's an option for sure. I mean, so that which, of course, there. yeah, and like – so where is Daniel Jones at this point with everything? I mean, it's every year. It's the same. seems to be the same conversation with him, you know, pro bowl yeah. against Washington and, and, you know, everywhere else, but where are they at with him? And is, is, I mean, clearly this is, I mean, if things don't change, it's going to be his last year, probably seems. Fifth year option was not picked up. So he's playing on the last year of his rookie contract. He obviously has to prove it. The giants do believe in him. They are high on, on, on Daniel Jones. Uh, John Mara said this all, you know, early in the offseason, like, we've done everything possible to screw this kid up, right? He's on quarterly number four in four years. They've been a mess. Look at his offensive line. It's gotten progressively worse. They had, couldn't keep anyone healthy last year for him. 
But at the same time, how can you be sold on Daniel Jones, John, at this point? What has he put out on the field to make you say, this is definitively our franchise quarterback? He hasn't. So it's make or break this year. And if the Giants have to, let's say Daniel Jones blows up, plays amazing, right? Say, this is the quarterback we want to build around, Brian Dable's offense, look, put him with the weapons, keep improving his line, look, we got something here. Then the Giants will say, fine, we didn't use the fifth-year option, we have to pay him, we're going to have to come up with some kind of contract that works, we have to pay him more money. That's a problem they would love to have. Right. They'll sure. take that problem. Right. You know, if they have that problem, so be it. And, and yeah, and I mean, I I think anybody would want that problem because it means you've got your guy, but I don't right. know where their proof is. What kind of difference can Dable make for him and for this offense? I think he can make a substantial difference. I mean, Jason Garrett came in with question marks, seemed like he had a very outdated offense, it was just not very, you know, 2022 or whatever year we're in now, you know, that was 2020 when he showed up. It was like there was no, minimal to no pre-snap motion. Uh, you know, it it just it just didn't work. Nothing worked. Uh, it was they 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 almost put the sh- shackles on Daniel Jones in a way like you know, you know limited like he was that was at least the positive about Daniel Jones under Pat Shermer is he would go out there and make plays and sling the ball around. And yeah, there was a lot of mistakes you wanted to cut back on. And they did cut back on the mistakes, but it was almost like an overcorrect. Mm-hmm. And so then you weren't getting the big plays. You weren't getting him making those plays downfield or making, you know, sticking throws in, in tight windows. And, you know, Brian Dable has been strong about saying, I told Daniel, I want him to, to take chances, to potentially make mistakes this spring, this summer, and say, hey, and realize, okay, I can, I can make this throw, or this is a throw that I can't make, or, you know, it's sort of like experimenting in practice, like that's what he views practice as, so I think it could have a huge influence on him, and you, you've seen the success, obviously, Brian Dabo had with Josh Allen, I like to use the term, they want to turn Daniel Jones into the jersey Josh Allen, which even if that's like 60%, 70% of Josh Allen, who wouldn't take 70% of Josh Allen? The dude's an MVP candidate, for God's sakes. Jersey Josh, there you go. Jersey how Josh much, Allen. How much fun is it to <laughs> – That how is much... so not Daniel Jones, by the way. Not even close. <laughs> how much fun is it to cover a new coach every couple of years? I'm jaded, I'll tell you that much. I, I'm sure you, you feel this, but, like, you hear the same song, and it's, oh, this guy, he's – He's look, he's 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 good, he's player friendly. The, this one we need a disciplinarian, and you go back and forth and back and forth, and you hear the flip side and the optimism, and like I'm jaded at this point. And I'm like, let until I see the product on the field, you know, we'll, we'll see. You know, and and you just you're in you're in that cycle and you're in that circle. And from a personal perspective, it sucks because I'm having to, you know, meet new people and create new sources every two years. So oh. I would appreciate if I would appreciate if they could kind of put a halt on this at some point point. and the funny thing is even here like that's how it was in the early 2000s here whereas every few years but at least like they stuck with gruden for six years right yeah and now, like this is rivera's third year so there's like this is a model of stability compared to that they just don't they haven't won but yeah, bruce, like, bruce allen lasted a long time man 10 years yeah, yeah. <laughs> he lasted quite a, a long time quite a decade and, and that, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, but it, I mean, they haven't won, so it hasn't paid <laughs> off. But the fact least, that they lasted that long while they haven't won is quite right. an eye-opening uh, thing, by the way. Right. And Rivera is not going to be any trouble unless they have some disastrous year, which I would have a hard time seeing barring c- catastrophic injuries. But, you know, who, yeah. the, who the heck knows? What about Kadarius Tony? Like, really good talent in college, kind of then not so good in the NFL and you know, all sorts of things swirling around him. It's like, yeah, it just, he's one of those guys. And I, I kind of refer back to Odell Beckham uh, in a way, like there's something about Odell that he just attracts that kind of stuff to him. You know, there's always something around him. Well, Kadarius Tony is sort of in that boat. I mean, he's proven to be 
so far, but 16 months he's been on the Giants. I mean, I could put a list up of things. The guy got COVID twice during that time. <laughs> you know, like you name it, and it's happened to him. I mean, granted, I'm not I'm not saying that's his fault, but, uh, right, but it's just who, uh, who knows? Happen. He might have put him, he might himself put himself in a bad situation. Who knows? Uh, you know, we don't know the details of that, but you know, his wrong size shoes like that doesn't ha- who ha- how that doesn't happen to anybody he couldn't practice because he had the wrong size cleats and then the injuries are starting to pile up you know hamstring knee shoulder uh you know little by little we've only been here a short period of time so very good talent we saw it for like six quarters last year but the health is definitely a concern and uh whether he's really going to put in that work when he's not in the facility is something when I spoke to people on the previous coaching staff that they had questions about that. They, they, they said they wouldn't get rid of him. Like getting rid of him would be a mistake. This guy could be a, a, a top, top receiver in That's the NFL, scary. but there's, there's questions. And he didn't, you know, he had a, it was reported that he had a procedure on his knee this spring. And didn't do anything in the spring now, again. You know, didn't show up for the beginning of OTAs the first week or so. Maybe it was because he was having that procedure. But anyway, you know, always something seems to be there. Yeah, it does. Um, You wrote a story recently on Saquon Barkley, getting that swagger back. Expectations there. Uh, I went to OTAs and minicamp without much expectation. Maybe I'm a sucker for this because I did it every year with Evan Ingram. But when you watch Saquon Barkley run around in shorts and a helmet, you know, no full pads, you're like, okay, you know, look at the physical skills. That's enticing. He looks good. He's catching a ball out of the backfield. You know, he's a supreme athlete. Maybe he lost a little bit with the injuries over the years, but he's still, when you watch him on the field, size, speed, ability to move and cut you're like wow and so i'm, I'm kind of back there again i'm still you still want to sit there and be in the wait and see mode like all right this is all fine and dandy again probably jaded me because i've seen it over and over right. but you sit there and you say well all right stay healthy do it on the field let me see it on the field before i really really believe it i'm not sure how i'm not like a million percent jaded at this point to be, to be honest so that, <laughs> maybe it's a difference between being the jersey and in, in dc i don't know but and i am to a point but like sometimes you get i am fooled. a natural uh cyn- cynicist let's say well, and i think sometimes you get fooled by some things or like the problem the one thing here though jordan like they've been close enough each year like seven to nine wins you're like hey you make these couple moves if these guys stay healthy then you get to hear. So like the yeah. scenario is not unrealistic. That's that's the thing here that's been the difference. Yeah. If they're coming off four wins, you're going to be more jaded, but you're seven wins in an injury-filled year. And you, th- right. And you think- Four well, wins, here we go. Right. And so, but if you're- cut, they were Three and, and 13, 10. here we go. Yeah. <laughs> but these guys were like seven and 10 and, um, but they had a ton of injuries and they upgraded a quarterback and they, you know, yeah. did all this. So then it's like, well, can they get there? Well, yeah. Will they? I don't know. But I, I only get to the deep. John, let me tell you. Let me tell you the difference. Okay, Washington. I almost called them the the R word again. I I don't know how you go by and never. I say almost it, did but. on the radio the other day. <laughs> but Washington, you know, like you said, they've had some good years, decent years. They they haven't been terrible. The Giants. I just want you to know the depths that they've fallen. The last five years, the worst team in the NFL, tied with the New York Jets is the New York Giants, record-wise. Five full years. We're talking about the worst team in the NFL. They're in that level. Like, the Jaguars have a better record. The Texans have a better – they've at least had a good season here or there, right? Uh, like you're, this, is, this is the company that they're keeping right now. It's the Jets and the Giants. <laughs> Go Meadowlands. Um, well, how do you like? I'm going to get to the their defense in a minute, but how do you view Washington at this point? And, you know, and I don't know how much you focused on what they've done, but you know, they got yeah. Carson Wentz, you know, some of the stuff. 
how do you view them as a contender in this in this division? Yeah, you know, it's curious because we were asked to rank the teams and I just sat down to do it and I, I didn't actually even do it yet. I'm tempted to, because I like to think outside the box, to put Washington first because I I do like their team. Like, I like a lot of the, the pieces that they have. Like, I felt they were a quarterback away. Now, every year we fill in mediocre quarterback and we're like, well, he's better than the other <laughs> slop they had last year, right? Like, each year it's like, well, he's better than the slop we had the previous year and he's better than the slop we had the previous year before that. But, I mean... I, I, and I was once a big Carson Wentz guy, but he's not ultimately the answer, right? But I do think that they can be pretty good. I'm, I think that they have – their weapons are improving. I don't know why they don't like uh, Antonio Gibson as much as everybody else in the world. But I think they do. I think they just want someone else. they don't. Yeah, they do like him. I think they also want someone else with him, though. For durability purposes? Yeah. A little bit right. of that. And then also, I think, I think Brian Robinson is maybe a more natural runner. So, you know, but they, I think they see St- Antonio. So, you know, who knows? Like, this is what they say, right. but actions we'll see. We'll see how. But they're, they've been adding some playmakers around yeah. on, on the offense. I like Jahan Dotson. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, you got Jahan Dotson, um, McLaurin, Gibson, Robinson. Like, I think the weapons are, are getting better. You're, they're getting there. So, I think they could be okay offensively, defensively. Is where I mean their front seven should be should be really good. It wasn't great last year, but it should it yeah. should be really good. So I don't know. I think they can be competitive in the division. I also think Dallas and uh, Philadelphia are going to be good, and Philly has a really easy schedule to open the season. So uh, it, between those three teams, I think the NFC East is actually going to be pretty good, which is not yeah. necessarily good for the Giants. And I know everybody's like they all have easy schedules too, so that that should benefit the entire division, but. I think Washington can compete in this NFC East because, uh, I mean, we're going to have this debate many times, John. Rank the quarterbacks in the division. Right. Who I, I think we all probably will say Dak is one. Right. And then, like, who else has a great quarterback? And there's no Aaron Rodgers here. There's no, no. Tom Brady. The Red, there's no name a quarterback in the a- a- AFC West. Like, they're all bad. All four quarterbacks in the AFC West are probably better than the four quarterbacks in the NFC East. Although maybe Derek Carr and – Hard, can, probably, yeah. But, yeah. but you get my point. Like I do. I mean, you can that, make the strong that, case that Wentz is the second best. Ahead. You can make the strong case that Wentz is the second best quarterback. I can make the case. I think Daniel Jones, if you put him with a good team, is the second best quarterback. Like if I'm, I, I was watched. I watched Jalen Hurts play multiple times last year, and I can tell you that if I, if Daniel Jones was on the Eagles and played behind that offensive line, I think Daniel Jones would be a better quarterback than Jalen Hurts. Or at least you can, like, Jalen, you can win games with Jalen Hurts. You can, like, you know, if Daniel Jones played behind, like, a really good team and had a really good offensive line like that and a good running game around him, like, you could dream that he could, he could do some real big things in this league as a quarterback. So, with, let's go to the Giants defense real quick. Kayvon Thibodeau, big guy, and Wink Martindale are the two big changes. What is the impact for yeah. by with those two potentially um, this year? Uh, yeah, well, you look at Wink Martindale and you say, okay, the key here is, especially with that the secondary I, ma- I named before, they're going to have to create pressure. Right. And that's kind of what Wink does. But at the same time, there's a point where if your cornerbacks are, that, are not good enough and your secondary is really not good enough, you're going to get shredded, which is what happened last year in Baltimore. Like, he had nothing left. He even made a comment, like, what did he learn from last year? You don't shop for cornerbacks at DoorDash. Yes. Like, it's kind of what the Giants did the next week. They went and picked up two Ravens castaways, you know, from the past few years in the middle of the spring because they realized, whoa, what do we got out here? Not much. So it could be a long year for the defense on that side unless the pass rush – with Wink creating stuff. I mean, the idea in his defense is create the illusion at the line of scrimmage that everybody's coming and you don't know where it's actually coming from. And that's partly why Kayvon Thibodeau was their guy because they like him moving around. He's had some success in in the middle. You could put him as a stand-up linebacker or anywhere in the formation. He could rush on the edge. That first step is dangerous when you could have him in a lot of different spots. So I expect him to – 
be used all over the field. And, I mean, it's hard to see him completely failing. I mean, he's a pretty good premium athlete. He's a uh, athlete. So, you know, I don't think he's – and I talk to a lot of people. The misconception to me is the expectation that he he's not in the same stratosphere as Chase Young as a prospect. To people, I, I mean, pretty much to a man, the people I talk to, it's like, he's, he looks like he's a good player. Like, in a normal year, he would have been, like, a borderline top 10 pick. Hmm. But this draft was really short on high, high, right. high-end guys it was. that he kind of got bumped up, and people seem to have this impression because of what they thought going into his senior year that he was, you know, a number one pick type kind of guy, which turned out to not really be the case. Right. but. He could, he should, and could be a good player, and I expect him to do damage. The fact that they have him and Aziz Ojolari, well, maybe I'm not blown away by either of them this year. It gives them two, at least legit pass rushers. John, yeah. Giants had oh, one wow. pass rusher, one edge rusher, one edge rusher in the last eight years that reached double digit sacks, and that was uh, Marcus Golden. So they, the Giants, who you think of this defensive team, pass rush, like that's their history. Right. Hasn't been there. Yeah, I'm going to say that's not a good stat. No, no. Do you, you want your edge rushers to get double digit? You, I mean, pretty much every team has an edge rusher that gets double digit sacks. Yes, they do. You know, you you over there might have two guys get double digit sacks if they stay healthy in if the same year. And then it's like with Chase, yeah. for Chase, for Chase, it's always about it's going to be about when does he come back because we don't know yet. Is he going to be back for the start of the season? Is it going to be a few games in? And the one thing I like that they're saying is that they're not putting a time, even as people close to him, we're not putting a timetable on. There's no, as Griffin once said, all in for week one. But that's going to be the key there. But yes, they have the potential for two guys to do that. So, you know, we'll, we'll see if it happens, but when they say that, that means that means that when they say that, that means they're usually ready for week one, but they don't want to put that pressure on them to be ready. And then, then if he's, then if he's not ready for week one, there are a lot of people think, Oh, he had a setback. It's got slower than usual. Right. And and it's a, it'll be a tricky one because he's the timetable of his recovery. And they, they had to, they had to do, you know, they had to take some stuff from his left knee, put in the right. So it makes it a more complicated situation, which maybe lengthens the timetable. But yes, I mean, the worst thing to me that you can do is put a time and say like, oh, we'll be back by then. And then you're not because that's like, well, you said you're going to be back. What's the issue? Well, the issue is you're just recovering from a tour ACL. So, you know. Saquon was in this exact boat last year. Didn't start practicing until the middle of the summer, really kind of late in the summer, actually, August. And he did get ramped up for week one and it, really wasn't you know he wasn't good it took him till like week four till you kind of started seeing you know the explosiveness but they didn't want to say the whole summer that the goal was to be back week one which it was the goal to be back week one yeah you know and what you know would be interesting or fun again is if these two teams actually played like meaningful I guess they played meaningful game and well not for this team it was in 2016 when but like just to get some big oh yeah I want to see some big games in this division again that so it's not like a December slog where you feel like you're going to exhibition games. The one team in this five-year stretch the Giants have had success against, by the way, John. There you go. I'm telling you, like Daniel Jones, you're going to build a statue just based off what he did against these guys. So I know. How do you not rank him the second-best quarterback in the NFC East? After <laughs> you, every time you see him, the guy's playing like, uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes. Because I watch other games, too. Uh, the other yeah. the other 15 in the season <laughs> so, all right man well thanks a lot for coming on anytime we'll do it again soon john all right that's it for this episode thanks to jordan for joining me and thank you as always for listening i'll continue my nfc east tour with espn's tim mcmanus coming up on Monday, talking about the Philadelphia Eagles and his take on the Washington Commanders. We'll talk to you next time.